This morning, I want to speak to you about the topic of get your head out of the clouds. Get your head out of the clouds. Just two weeks ago, we were celebrating a glorious Resurrection Sunday. It was a little peek at the new heaven and the new earth. There were three churches together. There were visitors and guests. There were some of the best omelets in the world. There were beautiful flowers. There were sweet children greeting us and wishing us happy Easter and singing. There was a challenging sermon. It was all capped off by hallelujah, hallelujah. I sort of felt like Peter when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Elijah and Moses. I'm just thinking, Jesus, it's good that we're here. Let's build a house. Let's stay here. There was this contagious joy and a sense of well-being and unity. But then the World Kitchen Aid workers were bombed in Gaza. And then that very week, we were once again bundled up in our winter coats and getting pelted by ice balls in a season the weather people call Sprinter. There was an earthquake in Taiwan, and now Israel and Iran, and more bloody violence in our city and around the world. There was an eight-year-old child killed in the back of the yards last night, along with 10 other people shot. Resurrection Sunday memories fade as we face our real-time lives. And I wonder if the disciples felt a bit like us. Up until that fateful Passover celebration, they had spent three years with Jesus. They were watching him heal and restore and renew. He even resurrected his friend Lazarus. He calmed waves and he fed 4,000 so much more. They had days and days of miracle watching and children blessing and smug smiles as Jesus once again outmaneuvered those religious leaders only to have all that hope stripped away and fear infest their hearts, confused and grief-stricken. They find themselves in this place, in this room, hiding out. Sure, the women had gone to the tomb and they had come back with some whacked out story about an angel declaring that Jesus had risen, but who could believe such nonsense? Women are the least credible creatures on the planet. Peter ran to the tomb, too, and he found the clothes that the women said, but there was no angel to confirm their story. So while Peter was amazed, he was not necessarily convinced. And then Cleopas and his buddy were traveling on the Emmaus Road, and they were chatting with a fellow traveler about all that had been going on, only to find out that in the breaking of the bread, they had been talking to the real, actual, risen Jesus. And when Jesus disappeared from their midst, they hightailed at those seven plus miles back to Jerusalem in the night, just so they could tell the other disciples that Jesus has indeed risen. And in the middle of Cleopas and his pal relaying their experience with Jesus, in the midst of all that, the man himself appears. Jesus just appears out of nowhere with a message. Peace be with you. What do you mean, peace be with you? I imagine the disciples are sort of scuttling around the room trying to back up how much distance can I get between me and this ghost. And then Jesus speaks to the core of their reality. Why are you afraid? Why do you doubt? Jesus invites them to touch him, to check out his hands and feet. He reminds them that ghosts don't have flesh and bones. And they find themselves in the same position as the man who said, I believe, help my unbelief. While filled with joy at the promise of this, of this being the real deal, they're still confused and bewildered and discombobulated and maybe even still a little disbelieving. They're a rolling mass of emotions. 
Okay, look, people, give me something to eat. Broiled fish is fine. So they gave Jesus some fish, and he eats. Well, he looks like a human. He walks like a human. He eats like a human. He, he talks like a human. He must be a resurrected human. And Jesus begins to speak to them, a familiar voice, reminding them of how he said that everything written in the law, everything written in the prophets, everything written in the Psalms must be fulfilled. He opens their minds so that they understand. See, it's just as I told you, the Messiah suffers and rises on the third day. This is so repentance and forgiveness is proclaimed in my name to all people of all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. I am sending upon you the Holy Spirit as promised. Wait for it. You'll need its power. They must have felt gobsmacked. There's been sorrow and grief and terror and confusion and disenchantment. Maybe they felt duped, startled, bewildered, and yet ecstatic and joyful and elated and all these emotions and more. It's like trying to walk through river rapids and before you can like even get your feet under you and figure out which way is up, he leads them to Bethany. At Bethany, he raises his hands, he blesses them, and then whoosh, he's taken up into the clouds. They respond with worship and joy, and upon their return to Jerusalem, they spend all of their time at the temple blessing God, which most likely really annoys the religious leaders. And so ends the Gospel of Luke. In the Acts encounter, the writer starts with a brief introduction that after the resurrection, Jesus presents himself alive to them by con many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And in this account, in the Acts account, we hear again that they are to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. In this account, they are still a little confused, wanting to know if this is when he's going to restore the kingdom of Israel. In other words, defeat the Romans and restore their geopolitical autonomy. And Jesus essentially responds with MYOB, mind your own business. Your marching orders are to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes to you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, period. End of sentence and whoosh, he's taken out of sight. The disciples are standing around, mouths agape, brains going berserk, when two guys in white robes appear and essentially say, get your heads out of the cloud. You heard the man, get going. And they do. They go back to Jerusalem and they devote themselves single-heartedly to prayer. The two stories, the two accounts are different and I'm surely not trying to make them the same or harmonize them as we were warned against in seminary. But I do offer both stories to help us focus on the consistent message of the resurrection, the consistent message from Jesus. When Jesus greets his disciples, he is not a resuscitated corpse. He doesn't look like a bed sheet with holes cut out for eyes. He comes to them in a renewed body, a body that bears the marks of his earthly journey and a body that transcends it, a body that is energized by the life of heaven. And it is a world-shattering renewal, a renewal that bridges earth as it is in heaven. And that's something today I look forward to when we can all have a new body energized by heaven. And the first words that Jesus speaks are peace, shalom. 
These words mean more than the absence of conflict. They are words of wholeness. They are words of safety. They are words of completeness, of total well-being, words that make wrong things right. And Jesus sees their state of discombobulation and breathes peace over them. You are safe. You are whole. Your whole being is well. In spite of external circumstances, you are well. He says, I got you. Then he tells them to wait, wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for the power that you will need to be my witnesses. Don't go charging out into the world unprepared, unprotected, and definitely unreliable. Jesus is saying that this new world that God has inaugurated through my ministry, through Jesus' ministry, is going to be handed down to you. And your work as my ambassadors is going to require all of the power and all of the wisdom that God has to offer. So don't, don't go tearing off half-cocked. Wait for this power because the message you are being entrusted with will be a message for the whole world, not just the Jews, my chosen people. It's a message for the Gentiles and the Romans and the Moabites and the Assyrians and the Ninevites and the whole wide world. It is a global message and it will not necessarily be a welcome message because a message of repentance and repentance and forgiveness are hard work. Putting another's well-being before your own is hard work. Admitting your complicity in another's pain is hard work. Looking at the face in the mirror is hard work. Watching children die, whether in Gaza or the streets of Chicago, is hard work. Choosing to work together is hard work. Choosing to work at all is hard work. Yes, for God's sake and the sake of God's world, wait for the power that is being offered, the power being provided, the power, the power, the only real power there is. And so they wait. But their wait is not passive, but preparatory. In their way, the Lucan text tells the believers find themselves continually in the temple praising God. In the Acts text, they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. Worship and prayer, prayer and worship, the only responses that make any sense when you come face to face with God. Prayer and worship, worship and prayer. That, that's the only thing that makes sense when you're entrusted with a life-saving and the life-giving message of Jesus. Sisters and brothers, we are entrusted with this message. And it is a message that helps us transcend our now earth with a foretaste of the new earth. The one that we pray for every week the one that we long for, the one that we wait for. It's a message of repentance and forgiveness, which is the only way out of our conflicts, big or small. Israel and Hamas, Ukraine and Russia, global warming and our addiction to comfort at any cost. Big conflicts are small, petty snarling over the breakfast table not taking out the trash, griping about not getting an A when our study habits were B worthy at best. Hard work, repentance and forgiveness over and over again, repentance and forgiveness over and over again, and hard work over and over again, but with God's power and with God's presence, with worship and prayer and prayer and worship, when we see and celebrate the glimpses of a new earth like Easter Sunday, and oh yes, my friends, there's an old hymn that says, we've a story to tell to the nations 
ambassadors of God, emissaries of Jesus, we are enlivened and energized by the Spirit. May it be so. Amen. Amen.